Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Journal Club. Tonight we have a fantastic guest, Dr. David Z, to talk about eye movements in the cerebellum. And I'm going to let Dr. Z give a little more insight into some of his background. So my background. <laughs> so I am a, I'm a Chicago boy. Came, came to Johns Hopkins in 1965 to start medical school and have been there ever since. Can't never, seem to break away. <laughs> never looked back. <laughs> uh, no, I'm a neurologist, but I have my hobbies uh, and they include dizzy patients and patients with eye movement abnormalities like nystagmus. I'm passionate about the cerebellum. Uh, I, I really started my academic career uh, studying patients with cerebellar disease and doing some work in experimental animals and um, still hacking away at that problem. The, the, it's, it's a, the cerebellum is a fascinating part of the brain and the way that patients present is always interesting for me and a challenge. But if you know the anatomy and physiology and you understand the blood supply, you could often make the right diagnosis and that's the beginning of treatment and therapy. Absolutely. I love that. All right. So tonight's topic, we are talking about eye movement disorders and the cerebellum uh, based off an article that you and Dr. Shamish wrote together in 2019. And so we're going to dig into that a little bit and talk about all of the exciting eye movements that one might see, uh, or at least a few, <laughs> uh, if there's an issue uh, with the cerebellum. So I always like to start out just very briefly because we have so many different folks who watch this, everything from a new clinician, a student, all the way to someone who is experienced, almost as experienced as Dr. Z is. So uh, when we talk about the vestibular system, that's our inner ear balance system. And that lives, you know, kind of deep inside that inner ear, neighbor to some hearing structures and senses kind of directional motion, rotation, and acceleration, things like that. With that, we also have the brain. So the brain has a multitude of areas that can process information, and some of those areas process information from that vestibular apparatus, that inner ear balance sensor, as well as information from the eyes and our body sensors and hearing and all kinds of other information getting integrated and uh, put together for folks to try to interpret our world. Um, unfortunately, as, as awesome as the brain is, it can have problems <laughs> of various types. And when those problems occur, sometimes we know that uh, because of, you know, different symptoms and signs that we might have on exams. So we're going to dig into some of the eye movement related signs and symptoms. The cerebellum in particular in our brain uh, is described as a, a network hub sometimes for optimizing eye movements through its connections with the brain stem and beyond, meaning everywhere else in the brain, and of course its connections with the eyes. Uh, if you could just kind of talk a little more about what that means to you, Dr. Z. Well, so the, the amazing thing about the cerebellum and why it both... Uh, gives us a lot of trouble and also gives us a lot, a lot of opportunity is it's extraordinary rich connections. And inputs come from everywhere. The cerebellum has access to virtually every sensation and every movement that we make. And uh, for our purposes tonight, especially when it comes to the vestibular system dizzy, dizziness, the only sensory apparatus that has direct access to the cerebellum is that from the labyrinth. Uh, all the other sensory inputs uh, stop in the brainstem on the way to the cerebellum, but the cerebellum needs to know exactly what's coming in from your inner ear. So that's both a challenge, but also it gives us a great opportunity to sort of sort out what patients are experiencing when their otoliths don't work, gravity sensors, or when their rotational sensors, the canals don't work. So it's right in the, in the middle of things. And, and the second big point about the cerebellum, of course, 
is that it, it plays a major role in uh, learning, in keeping everything calibrated. Uh, my mentor uh, used to call it the, uh, the repair shop of the brain. So when things are going wrong, the cerebellum keeps an eye on it. When reflexes are not correct, if you move your head and you can't see, it gradually uh, changes how things are being processed to improve our uh, behavior. So bottom line is you have a structure which is intimately associated with every aspect of movement and which is intimately associated with how we recover from stroke or trauma, uh, how we learn to adapt to a new pair of glasses. So uh, it's right in the mainstream of everything with respect to dizziness and vestibular movements and all eye movements are represented in the cerebellum because they all started with vestibular eye movements and, and evolved from there on. Got it. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely a, a star, shall we say. <laughs> um, so in your article, you did a nice uh, job of kind of honing in on a few key areas of the cerebellum uh, that are related to the control of eye movements. Uh, we're going to go through each of those and different uh, kind of um, different types of eye movements that might be affected uh, if there are lesions in any of these areas. So uh, the three areas are the flocculus and paraflocculus or tonsil complex, and you kind of continue to name those in both ways. I'm guessing that's just something that's common in the literature. You'll hear it both ways. This is the way it is with many vestibular uh, parts of the anatomy. Is it the superior canal or is it the... Uh, you know, anterior canal, that sort of thing. So we just have to kind of get used to that language. And then uh, number two, you cover the kind of area of the inferior cerebellar vermis, which includes the nodulus and the ventral uvula. And then our third area that you go into quite a bit is that dorsal vermis, uh, which includes the vestigial nuclei. Um, so, and you, you specifically say in the article that you emphasize abnormalities that can be seen at the bedside on a simple visual inspection. So when you say that, you mean kind of not necessarily needing specific uh, kind of equipment, is that correct? Oh yeah, I think uh, one of my favorite little uh, talks is about uh, how do you diagnose a dizzy patient when you're marooned on a desert island? <laughs> and, you know, you don't need much. You need your brain more than you need some fancy recording. Uh, but, uh, you know, basically, uh, you have a, a structured, ordered exam, and you examine uh, eye movements like saccades, rapid movements between stationary targets. So look there, look there, and you see if they're accurate. Because uh, if they're not accurate, that tells you one thing. If they're not the normal speed, that tells you another thing. Then you examine the smooth tracking eye movements and you look at the ability to use those to suppress your vestibular reflex. And uh, then we have the vestibular movements themselves, you know, rapid head movements, and then like positional testing. So uh, you don't need much, much stuff. You got to have a, you know, if you're going to do positional testing, you got to have a pretty strong back and good arms. <laughs> if you're going to do uh, head impulse testing, you have to maybe have been a ping pong player and have strong <laughs> wrists. If you're gonna look for strabismus or double vision or what we call skews, very common with vestibular disease, you just need to cover your hand and you can uh, eliminate fixation, you know, uh, so you can see the true nystagmus with the little pen light fixation test. So uh, it, 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 there's a lot you can do with, without any equipment. You just have to use your brain to know what to do when. What are the possible diagnoses? And what tests do I do right. uh, for that particular person? And then the other piece I would say is, oh, practice and mentorship and, and being able to perhaps, you know, see what abnormal uh, findings look like. Uh, whether that's through video or what have you, because something that comes up, at least in my world a lot, quite a bit, is I'll have these newer clinicians and they'll say, well, was that abnormal? Well, I was like, no, they're just looking around. <laughs> like, you know, so you kind of that whole, you know, being able to uh, discern uh, what is an abnormality, something that's, I'm sure, like automatic pilot for you, right? Um, but for newer clinicians, I would say in particular, not so much, right? 
Well, you're you're absolutely right. Um, you know, normal folks. <laughs> Let's take the psychotic system. N normal folks, they'll undershoot a little bit when they go out because and make a small correction. When they come back to center, they may overshoot a little bit, especially if it's a big one. When they go from up to down, they often have a big overshoot. Uh, but in a normal subject, if they do this five or six times, they learn to correct it. Mm -hmm. If you have a cerebellar patient, they're going to keep overshooting or keep undershooting. So this is simple stuff if you just hold two stationary targets and have and look and see how you're how accurate you are. Once you've seen a few of these abnormalities, you're going to recognize them. Right. That's the key. I agree completely. All right. So let's talk about some of these tests. So we're going to start with the flocculus and paraflocculus areas or the tonsil complex and one thing that you kind of name out in this paper uh, is the impaired tracking of objects moving in the environment either with the head still or moving so that first one would be what we call smooth pursuit which you just described so nicely um, and you note in the paper that a downward pursuit is often more involved than an upward pursuit and then we have VOR suppression which is where kind of in the picture here you can see the person's target is their thumbnail and they're moving their head with that arm so that they have their target moving with their head. Um, and what we want to see is the eyes basically just staying on the target, right? So why don't you go ahead and, and people talk about this kind of psychotic intrusions. Um, and, and do you feel like that that is something that you're going to see until they have practice almost the way with the overshoots, undershoots, or is it not that way with this? So um, I, for me, a psychotic intrusion is something that intrudes on fixation. So uh, let's say I'm looking straight ahead and all of a sudden I do that. We, we call those psychotic intrusions or square wave jerks. Uh, and they are common in older people, in people with a variety of of problems. They're especially prominent in two conditions, cerebellar disease and a, a condition called progressive supranuclear palsy, where patients have trouble looking up and down. And, you know, people with schizophrenia have psychotic intrusions. So they're, they're, you know, not so useful most of the time. And you can see them in normal circumstances. What is most important is to detect that psychotic dysmetria. And if I had one test to do in everybody, well, I should say two, I would do a vestibular test and a saccade test because they're so easy to see the abnormality. So if I'm looking there, go Ooh, like that. Maybe later, if we have time, I can show you some videos of these things. Sure. Uh, uh, same thing with smooth pursuit and vestibular cancellation. It, once you see them, you, you, you can recognize them. I have to tell you, at my hospital, I, I would send the patients before I even saw them sometimes to the physical therapist because they know how to do a good eye movement exam. They know how to test for a positional vertigo. Um, you, you know, uh, physical therapists are, are, are super because they learn these things and you can uh, sometimes uh, just send the patients to the person who can treat them. Right, right. It's just when it gets more complicated with the medical management, we want to make sure that we have the right physician on board. But obviously, it's, it's case by case. So you make a good point there. Um, so moving to this second slide here on flocculus, parasflocculus defects, uh, you talk a bit about the inability to hold the gaze steady, uh, which is both straight ahead. So that'd be us seeing a, a spontaneous nystagmus. And then also this kind of eccentric positions, which is the gaze evoked. So when the person is gazing left or right or up, um, you might see an astagmus in the direction in which they're gazing generally for cerebellar issues. Is that correct? Yeah, so uh, I, you're talking about gaze evoked nystagmus. <laughs> uh, just to make a couple of points, like with saccades, occasionally normal subjects have a little gaze evoked nystagmus. Um, the way I deal with that is uh, if it goes away very quickly, it could be 
physiologic. Uh, and, you know, a, another trick at, at the exam is so if they look out here and their eye is beating out, that would be a right beating gaze of open astagmus, the eyes drifting to the center and beating out. You move the target in just a little bit so that both eyes see the target. You know, you gotta, it sort of depends on how big your nose is mm -hmm. when that place is going to be. But if you bring that target in where both eyes are seeing it and there's no gaze of oak nystagmus, that suggests that the gaze of oak nystagmus out there might have been physiologic. Okay. Right. So, right. Uh, but gaze of, and you can see gaze of, gaze of oak nystagmus is central but it doesn't mean catastrophic. People on all kinds of medications will have a little gaze of nystagmus. This late in the evening, there's probably people here who've had some wine tonight, and I suspect they may have had gaze of nystagmus. And uh, so, so that's what you have to look for. And of course, I'd like to quote my good friend, Michael Homagi, who says, uh, if you have a patient with nystagmus, and you don't put on some frenzel lenses or some way to eliminate right. fixation to see the true nystagmus. He says, it's like examining a patient with a heart murmur without a stethoscope. So uh, it's very important to remember when you have a, a patient with nystagmus, you need to know if it's there or how much it changes with and without fixation. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And, and I think with that, uh, we could mention this at any point in the talk, but I, I feel like this comes up so often. Physical therapists who are newer, they'll say to me, you know, as I'm maybe mentor them, mentoring them or whatnot, well, when should I refer? You know, I thought I saw this or I maybe thought that, you know, should they see the neurologist? Do you have any kind of general guidelines? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm very happy for you to refer <laughs> patients to me, except when I'm on vacation. <laughs> So, so when I'm on vacation, I don't want to hear uh, guidelines. You know, w what can I say? Uh, if you're not sure about the diagnosis, refer. Sure. Okay. If the patient has some of the red flags, you know, of a neurological disease, uh, pain being one of the most important ones, uh, if they have double vision mm -hmm. in addition to some vague dizziness, if they have trouble walking, uh, you, you, these patients, you know, a decision is going to have to be made about imaging and probably you want to do that in consultation with whatever neurologist or ENT person you work with. Uh, now, BPPV, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, is, is another issue. I'm not, if, if they have a typical pattern and they get better when you treat them, you know, you don't need to right. send them to a doctor. Uh, if they have hearing loss, that always demands a careful evaluation, especially if it's uh, asymmetrical. So, um, you know, it, another thing depends upon how long you have to wait to see that physician. <laughs> if you have to wait six months for an appointment, you know, maybe, maybe you just see how the patient does for a little bit. Sure. So you, you get my point. No, I do. I do. Um, I think for me, um, just to add to that a little bit, I agree with everything you said. Um, I think if I see other neurologic signs, and I think most physical therapists should be aware of these. So if someone comes in, I'm seeing what I think are some central cerebellar signs with eye movements, and they have an intention tremor or, you know, some kind of other neurologic signs, you know, weakness, uh, anything that kind of just stands out to me as kind of a neurologic presentation that's not explained, right? If someone's coming in with a known diagnosis of MS, um, okay, like that, that fits for me, right? I'm not surprised when I see, you know, some central cerebellar eye movements, right? Oh, oh yeah. I think if you find anything uh, uh, I mean, from my point of view, a physical, if I were a physical therapist, I would be most comfortable with uh, positional vertigo syndromes. There are rare, cent rare central ones, but if they get better when you treat them, uh, you're probably okay. Uh, right. Any other cranial nerve abnormalities, uh, any, any uh, focal weakness, you know, that, 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 that needs to be... Uh, sort it out. Absolutely. All right. So with that in mind, uh, deficit number three for the flocculus and paraflocculus that I've 
uh, noted in your paper was about post saccadic drift. Um, so this is something that I think we don't get as much in our uh, vestibular courses. It was something I had some familiarity with, but I'd say it's not mentioned as often. So uh, my understanding from the article is it's a brief movement that lasts just a few like milliseconds uh, following each saccade. Um, and that the direction in the paper, it's noted that whether it kind of drifts back or kind of toward, you know, kind of past, if you will, the direction of the saccade either way um, is kind of irrelevant, I guess, if I could say what idiosyncratic means, not necessarily meaningful um, for where the lesion is. Um, you want to add anything about post saccadic drift? Yeah, you know, this, this is a fine point that uh, we really can't see clinically or really use clinically. It, it, it's simply a, a fact that when the when the flocculus and paraflocculus are not working properly, the brain can't match the movement as well with the position holding. Mm -hmm. So it drifts one way or the other way. It, it, from a practical clinical level, you know, it, it just falls way down the list because you can't see it. Good. So I'm not too worried about not having heard about it as much then. That's great. <laughs> but it's good to note. Uh, and then, of course, positional nystagmus. So this is a big one because this is what I like to call the mimickers, right? This kind of confusion of, you know, is it this a central issue or is this our classic, you know, sort of BPPV of the horizontal canal, right? Um, so what was noted here in this section was that you might see a geotropic uh, which for those who are not familiar is towards the ground. So this is the patient's laying on their back. You turn their head to one side and let's say you turn the head right, the eyes are beating right, which is towards the ground since the person's lying on their back. You turn the head to the left and then the eyes start beating toward the ground again, which is towards that patient's left in that example. So this is what we typically see in someone with a horizontal canal. Um, Canalithiasis, the crystals are floating in the canal in this case. Um, and then on top of that, unfortunately, uh, what is noted here is that the, an, an, an astagmus due to flocculus lesions may suppress in room light, which is typically what we expect with peripheral vestibular issues, um, especially, I guess, if the uh, flocular lesion is unilateral. Um, anything you want to add about this? This is a toughie. So these are two good points. Um, you know, you know, lateral canal BPPV is far more common than, than we normally think about it. Uh, it's, it's not it usually as uh, easily uh, diagnosed because it goes away so quickly on its own often. So you mentioned two types. The one where you have to worry more about a central cause is the apogeotropic, mm. where it mm -hmm. beats to the sky. And that's usually related very closely to lesions in the cerebellar nodulus, which mm -hmm. is the bottom end of the vermis. Uh, the geotropic kind is uh, almost always peripheral. Um, uh, there are uh, reports with lesions of the flocculus, but those patients almost invariably have other eye signs, like markedly impaired pursuit. Mm -hmm. It's the apogeotropic one. And I, I'll give you a, a couple pieces of advice. Uh, if if a patient has a BPPV and is not getting better like they should mm -hmm. and you get an MRI scan, okay, you must make sure that you and the radiologist look at the nodulus. Mm. You're probably going to get to that. <laughs> uh, I think that's another one, one of the it's areas. Coming up. <laughs> that's, that's apogeotropic. Um, so um, the fixation suppression issue that you me measured, you said it exactly right. Uh, here, here's the rules I use. A peripheral should almost always markedly suppress uh, nystagmus with fixation. A central one, if it doesn't suppress at all, you're home free. Mm -hmm. That is central. If it partially suppresses, and especially with a unilateral lesion, uh, that can happen with a central lesion. So it, it's just what you said. Perfect. It, like so many things, if it's there, you can use it. If it's not there, you, you may not be sure. 
but you're hopefully going to see some other central sign. And that's why that full ocular motor screening for certainly Smooth Pursuit Saccades is, to me, very essential. And I do worry because yeah. I know there are sometimes clinicians out there that kind of, they're in a rush. I don't know. They're like, oh, I'll just do a quick head thrust test and check for BBVV. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> I really think that's not a good idea, right? Because you might miss something that would, you know, give you more information, right? Yep. Perfect. All right. So moving forward on this flocculus paraflocculus situation, uh, we might also see an ocular tilt reaction, particularly for unilateral lesions. So most people describe this as a type of skew deviation. And you mentioned test of skew where we're covering an eye and looking for eyes shifting, um, you know, kind of depending on whether they're viewing something or not, um, or we're getting that kind of um, a vertical or horizontal eye shift of any kind. Um, and the, the ocular tilt itself is someone that's coming in the door with their head leaned. Do I have that right? Yeah. Um, so the, the, the ocular tilt reaction is, uh, it's equivalent to a spontaneous nystagmus when there's a canal deficit. This is a, an otolith deficit. And rather than a dynamic change, like with a nystagmus when you have one labyrinth working, now you have one set of, uh, of uh, otoliths working, you have a static change. And, uh, you know, what, what's happened is we've become rabbits again. Uh, <laughs> if you're a little old rabbit and you tilt your head like this, your brain wants those eyes aligned on the meridian, okay? So we would correct. So even though the head's tilted, the eyes are aligned along the horizontal meridian. So that, that's a normal response in a rabbit. So ocular tilt is normal, a rabbit. So we kind of brought our eyes around front. And now when we tilt, mm. we want a counter roll. But when there's an imbalance, a old ra uh, rabbit kind of phylogenetically old reflex comes out and we do that kind of thing. Awesome. Uh, it's so easy to see. You just do this alternate cover test. It's very common with brainstem lesions. It can be very localizing. Uh, you know, if the lesion is in uh, the midbrain or the, the MLF, the eye is higher on the, on the side of the lesion, high, high. And if the lesion is in the vestibular nuclei or even a little bit in the eighth nerve, the eye is lower on the side of the lesion, low, low. So high, high, low, low, uh, that doesn't mean I'm leaving. I'm talking about brainstem <laughs> localization now. Uh, so it's, it's useful to know about it. And of course, it's part of HINTS, the diagnostic algorithm for a stroke. Uh, the cerebellar issues with these skews are a little difficult. Uh, the side is not always so easy to be sure of. Much easier in the brainstem. But mm -hmm. patients with cerebellar disease do get these mm -hmm. uh, as well. And, and I think this is a good moment to talk about, you know, I've had patients come in years out from a brain tumor and their brainstem being removed or a brain injury that's significant, um, the long lasting effects, I mean. Um, do these all resolve these kind of abnormalities or do you find they tend to stick around or does it depend? So if they're in the brainstem, uh, uh, you know, pretty deep in these pathways, they, they may hang around for quite a while. Uh, in, in, you know, if cerebellum normally fixes these things up. So if the cerebellum is sick and you have a brainstem lesion, which is not unusual because the arteries that go to the mm -hmm. cerebellum all have a branches that go to the uh, brainstem as well. Uh, you know, you may not be able to adapt for it. Uh, but these are pretty big, bad lesions where you don't adapt to them. Yeah, got it. All right. So, um, you know, we talked about this already, this kind of when we might see suppression uh, with room light, when we don't. Um, you also point out in the article that vertical nystagmus is not a feature of a unilateral flocular or paraflocular lesion. Um, and it's just kind of interesting because most of the time I think of cerebellar lesions and I'm thinking there's a good chance I might see vertical nystagmus. Um, so this is kind of maybe what you would call an exception. What do you think? 
Well, pure vertical nystagmus, of course, like pure torsional nystagmus is a, is a central sign. Uh, if it's downbeat, it's uh, usually somewhat bilateral cerebellar thing. Uh, if it's pure torsional, it, it's often in the vestibular nuclei. If it's pure upbeat, it's in the midline medulla. So, so those are all pretty localizing. Uh, Another problem is, is, is the cerebellum is kind of pluripotential. If the flocculus goes bad, the nodulus has some role. Smooth pursuit is represented in like at least three mm -hmm. different structures of the cerebellum. So one part can fix up another part. Uh, but you're so right. And even with the apogeotropic horizontal nystagmus due to central, there's almost always a vertical component mm -hmm. with it, too. Downbeat nystagmus is a red flag. Upbeat nystagmus is a red flag. Uh, now, when you get mixed vertical torsional, it could be peripheral, BPBB, for example. Uh, you know, I, I probably would be in another field if this were all worked out. It gets, <laughs> you know, I've been at it for a half a century, but we still, it's complicated, this stuff. I still have nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. All right, we've got to move on to the nodulus and ventral uvula, of course. And one um, type of spontaneous nystagmus that you mentioned in the article that could be seen um, in folks with lesions in this area would be this periodic alternating nystagmus. So I am going to show this video. If I can sort it out. go. Nice Dan Gold video. We love these. So here's a patient and right now their eyes are beating to the patient's left. That lasts for a bit. I'm going to speed this along for time purposes. Now we start, and this patient is just looking straight ahead, we start to get a right beat. There it is. All right, so I did have to jump ahead, but that's how this is. It's not like it switches, you know, three beats right and three beats left from what I understand. It's, it's going to be more this kind of beating to one direction for a bit, you know, 60, 90 seconds, something in that range sounds like, and then it switches off. So this is... Uh, something that I have to admit I have not seen in clinic. So I feel like it's probably pretty rare, which I guess is a good thing. Um, so do you want to add anything about that particular type of nystagmus? Yeah, it, it, there's some unique features about it. It is rare. Uh, it's pretty easy to make the diagnosis when, when two people, one the intern and one the resident, are talking about it, and they argue about what direction it, it's in. Um, and uh, when I switch to the video, I wonder if I did that. Are we okay? Can you hear me? Still on. Are we still in? Apologies, everyone. In... Just a little technical issue, but we'll be right back on here. If my video threw things off, happens. Check, check, one, two. Thanks for your patience. I didn't talk. Go ahead and say something else for me, Dr. Z. Can you hear me? There we go, I apologies. I think my video threw everything off. My. That's life, right? All right, here we go. Back in action. Okay, so I'm sorry. Dr. Z, you were going to say something about that periodic alternating nystagmus. Go right ahead. So it's rare. Um, you can make the diagnosis when uh, two people who've examined the patient argue about what direction the nystagmus was beating because they were looking at different times in the cycle. <laughs> <laughs> We, we know exactly the localization for the typical form. 
It's one of the few forms of nystagmus that we can nail the anatomical localization. It's the cerebellar nodulus. And we have a unique treatment for most of these patients. It was the first treatment that actually stops the nystagmus. Wow. It's with baclofen. All right. Drug. And we understand its pathophysiology probably better than almost any other kind of nystagmus. Uh, basically, you remove inhibition from the vestibular nuclei because the nodulus isn't working. Mm -hmm. So the vestibular system, vestibular nuclei starts to run away with uh, loss of inhibition, developing nystagmus in one direction. And then we have an intact adaptive mechanism that always tries to stop nystagmus, makes nystagmus go away after a vestibular neuritis, for example. And that adaptive mechanism stops it, but then it takes off and goes off in the other direction. And every two minutes and 10 seconds, this happens while you're awake. And uh, that, that, that's the story. It's, it's localizing, it's understood, and it's treatable. That's awesome. Well, that's what we want something that's treatable. <laughs> Goodness knows. Uh, so another type of spontaneous nystagmus, however, that can also be seen in folks with a lesion in the nodulus or ventral uvula could be a downbeat nystagmus. Um, and this downbeat nystagmus can be suppressed uh, with visual fixation. So it's only seen in the darkness um, and the slow phase velocity is not increased with a lateral gaze or decrease in an up gaze. So um, kind of another type of spontaneous nystagmus to look out for. Uh, another deficit you might see in the nodulus or ventrouvular area would be this loss of the normal decrease in the VOR time constant after repetitive stimulation in the dark. So this kind of gets a little deeper into vestibular testing. I know there's varying levels of comfort for folks on kind of what that looks like. My understanding is you're sitting a patient in the dark, um, and normally you would get a certain nystagmus, just like if a kid spins in a chair, <laughs> right? And then they stop and you see this kind of uh, residual, if you will, nystagmus. Um, so I think the key here is, is a clinician gonna see this or kind of stimulate this type of response, or is this something you're only gonna see uh, with kind of more specialized uh, VNG type testing? What would you say? Well, the, the, the most, uh... So you're <clears throat> a little physiology here just to explain what's happening and then we'll we'll, we'll make it useful clinically. <clears throat> when, when we uh, rotate rotated around at constant speed, we all know we did this when we were kids, the nystagmus gradually fades away. And then if you stop, wow, you go in the <laughs> other direction. <clears throat> so um, the reason it fades away in the first place is because the little sail inside the inner canal, inner ear canal called the cupula, you start spinning and it goes over there, but the elastic restoring forces bring it back to center, even though you're still spinning. So after a while, you're spinning, but your brain doesn't even know you're spinning. So that's not good. The brain doesn't know what you're doing. So the brain developed a mechanism to sort of improve the equivalent of what this cupula was doing. It's called velocity storage, velocity storage. So when you spin around uh, at a constant speed, the cupula comes back in like seven or eight seconds, but the nystagmus lasts three times that because the brain has centrally uh, perseverated it. This is done by mathematical integration. Anyway, just remember the brain can make it longer, which is a good thing. If the brain makes it too long, then you get periodic alternating nystagmus. It runs away. But how do we use this at the bedside? Well, if you rotate around for a minute in a chair and then stop, you get a certain amount of nystagmus post-rotatory. But this is a normal subject. But if you rotate around, again, the same way, and stop, but now bend your head forward, the nystagmus fades away very quickly. Mm. This is called tilt suppression. The nodulus detects that you've stopped because your head is tilted, you don't have a gravity signal that's changing, so it dumps this unwanted nystagmus. If it doesn't do it, you have a nodulus lesion. 
Ah. And our colleagues, our colleagues in the, in Argentina, use this to help diagnose strokes mm -hmm. because central lesions. Because if it didn't dump, central, if it did dump, it got much less when you tilted the head over. Uh, that's usually normal central function. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, whether you're going to do this at the bedside is another question. <laughs> is that patient going to be willing? <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's nice to understand this. You, you're you're going to read about velocity storage in a, in a lot of different ways and time constants. But the easiest way for me to understand it is just a way for the brain to kind of perseverate low frequency responses. Mm -hmm. And that's what the nodulus controls low frequency, VOR. The flocculus, parafloculus controls the high frequency, VOR, quick movements. That's the anatomical separation. Perfect. All right. Well, that's really interesting. Uh, moving through the nodulus and ventral uvula, more deficits to be found. We can see cross coupling. Uh, so the idea is that you might see a vertical nystagmus during a horizontal rotation. Um, and then also a downbeat nystagmus might happen after a, a horizontal head shake test, which is a very common bedside test. I think a lot of folks are comfortable with that one. Um, and we know if we see vertical nystagmus with that, that is not peripheral. Um, that is not what we expect with peripheral lesions. So really good ones there. Uh, ocular tilt again comes up with this uh, area as well. Um, and it sounds like it can present very similarly um, in a sense to what you we already discussed with the flocculus or parafloculus areas. So um, is there any differences between those two as far as this tilt situation or pretty similar? I, I, I don't know solid evidence uh, yet about, you know, sidedness, flocculus versus nodulus. Um, what I use... Uh, in terms of skew, is uh, the alternating skew that you see with cerebellar disease. Maybe you'll get to the, You look to the right, the eyes do that. Yeah. You look to the left, the eyes do that. The, the ocular tilt reaction is this kind of problem. This problem relates to this. Now you're we're rabbits again. You know, it's re it's really cool to be a rabbit, so you understand why people are dizzy and seeing double. But, you know, if a rabbit pitches his head forward and then looks to the side, you're going to get a skew. You think about that tonight after this talk. Yes. Uh, draw a picture, show it at a cocktail party. Uh, you know, this is why the vestibular system is, is fantastic. Just in time for spring, at least here in the U.S. I love it. All right. Um, so we can't forget smooth pursuit. You can see that uh, downward pursuit is impaired. Uh, more so, again, than this upward pursuit uh, if there's a lesion in the nodulus or ventral uvula area. Um, and again, this is good, described similarly um, with those lesions in the flocculus or paraflocculus area. So again, kind of familiar territory here. Uh, and then positional nystagmus. So you mentioned that apogeotropic horizontal nystagmus. So again, folks, you know, patients laying on their back, you turn their head to the right. Now the eyes are beating to the left. This is away from the ground. And then you turn their head to the left. The eyes are beating away from the ground to the right. Um, and what was interesting to me is this kind of statement, depending on whether the faulty estimate of gravity is pitched backwards or forwards, one could get a geotropic or apogeotropic direction changing horizontal positional nystagmus, which again, it would mimic some sort of horizontal canal BBV. So anything you want to add on that? It's complicated. <laughs> I will give you one simple clinical cue, clue for uh, a horizontal, uh, peripheral type lateral canal BPPV. <clears throat> you know, you're always asking wh which side is it? Well, it's pretty simple. People say, well, you should remember ampulla fugal, ampulla pedal, it's moving. <laughs> it's too hard for, a, for an old yeah. man. So, so what, you, what, what, what you remember is, Whichever side, which if it's right ear down or left ear down, mm -hmm. whichever ear down is the most intense, it's beating to the bad ear. Mm -hmm. Yes, that? yes. It doesn't matter whether it's apogeotropic beating to the sky, geotropic beating to the ground. Whichever ear down gives you the most intense nystagmus, no matter what the pattern, it's going to be beating to the bad ear. Mm-hmm. 
Yes, and I know people sometimes use the bow and lean or supine to sit test as a way to kind of add information, and I'm not opposed to that. I think, especially supine to sit, you're already doing, um, you know, kind of during positional testing, so I think it can be a nice way, and for those who aren't familiar, you know, you can look into that, but essentially it's just an additive way to confirm, and I like to see everything follow the rules. That's kind of my number one with BBBV. If I have a nice clean ocular motor test and I'm checking for BBBV and I find signs of uh, geotropic nystagmus that's acting like, you know, horizontal canal BBBV and they're symptomatic and so forth, um, as opposed to people who are totally asymptomatic, that's a little at least lightly concerning, you know, if they have lots of nystagmus and they're like, I feel mm -hmm. fine. <laughs> it's like, hmm. Let so me think about that. <laughs> I, I love that you said you like to follow the rules because uh, we just had a patient who uh, was part of a research study, but the, uh, the uh, clinical doctors in the ED who examined her didn't know what we were finding. And they ended up treating the uh, wrong canal, the wrong side, and the wrong maneuver, and the patient got better. <laughs> And if you actually think it through, that's very possible. If you yeah. don't do your dick, if you don't do your Dix Hall Pike exactly right or your Epley exactly right, you can treat a lateral canal even oh, though you were, sure. you were treating a posterior canal. You've probably seen <laughs> that. So if we're going to get any rigor out of all of this, we shouldn't depend upon doing the wrong thing. Right. Right. No, it's right. Deep. You do the best job you can, at least. That's for sure. All right. Well, we, we must make sure we have enough time to cover the poor ocular motor, vermis, and fastigial ocular motor region. So we'll, we'll kind of conclude on that here. So we, the big deal here is saccades. That was the emphasis that I got out of the article. So for lesions in the ocular motor uh, vermis, we're talking about, um, you know, hypometric and possible hyperometric saccades, depending on which direction and so forth. You can dig into those details if if you want to um, as a viewer here. And then the bilateral lesion could cause a uh, hypometric direction, uh, saccades in both directions. So, you know, I have this up because this is a treatment. You know, a lot of clinicians is kind of like two targets and move your eyes towards a target and turn their head towards it and eyes and head. We call this gaze substitution or active eye and head movements. I've heard it have lots of names as well. Um, you know, the idea is to try to treat saccades, you know, something that I think has come up more than once too is, you know, are we more worried about reducing symptoms or are we looking to get the saccades more accurate? And when is that realistic or not realistic for someone with central vestibular issues? Um, so always symptoms are more important than signs. Um, so Tough to treat saccadic dysmetria in patients with cerebellar disease because the cerebellar's job is to make the saccades <laughs> accurate. Uh, we've had a little success uh, pharmacologically with mm. memantine in treating some patients who have excessive saccadic intrusions or lots of overshoot dysmetria. Uh, it, it's a toughie. And uh, I, I'm not aware... I mean, you can help me here of, of, of good data showing that you can uh, kind of treat cerebellar saccadic dysmetria. Patients are much more bothered by double vision mm -hmm. and by uh, poor vision when they move their head. Uh, most patients don't come in and say, gee, I don't think my smooth pursuit is up to snuff. <laughs> You know, or uh, gee, uh, yesterday I looked to the right and I had a psychotic overshoot. I mean, <laughs> patients, patients don't come in with that. They come right. in, I have double vision or I can't see or read when I move my head. And to me, that's where focus of therapy usually mm -hmm. should be, folk, should be, uh, tar tar that should be the target. Right. No, I, I think you're right. Uh, I think what I like to use this sort of treatment is, you know, sometimes this faster head movement is kind of gaze stability exercises that are one of the mainstays uh, of current vestibular rehab are just too much to start with. The patient, you know, can't coordinate their head movement or they just get too dizzy off the bat with it. And it's just not appropriate to start at that level. So the active eye and head for me are good because it's a way to kind of break down these kind of head turns, which is really what I'm trying to achieve um, in a slower motion 
you know, and kind of lets them kind of work through that a little bit before we were to go to a full no, as I like to call, <laughs> you know, the horizontal uh, VOR exercises, as they call them, mm -hmm. right? So this is, to me, you know, a more functional way to progress patients. And I think mm -hmm. that if we... So I like what you just said, especially uh, about treating in a functional way. You know, if we do all these exercises, I mean, you know, we, we don't we do not do this in normal <laughs> life very, very often, Lesser, you know. Oh, right. you, know you, you might be saying no to someone, you know. But, you know, uh, but we move our heads and then we move our eyes. Uh, one reason that saccades are a little accurate when we start from way out, they overshoot or when we go out, because we don't ever do that naturally. Right. We always move our head in. Our, we almost always start a saccade within plus or minus 10 degrees of straight ahead because we, we, we line up our heads. So the idea of doing something like watching a tennis match back and forth, uh, doing something natural, doing something fun, yes. and doing something that relates to uh, normal activities. Uh, you know, walking around with a, a times two training, uh, it, it's, it's okay, but I don't think you're going to get a lot of patients to do that for, you know, a couple hours a day, which is, you know, you need a lot of training, but it's right. got to be fun. No, definitely. I think you hit the nail on the head there. All right. So with that in mind, uh, also saccades can be impaired for someone with uh, issues with their vestigial, I'm going to say that, ocular motor region, um, and they could get hypermetria as well in all directions. Um, and then you mentioned Wallenberg syndrome in the article uh, hopefully folks are familiar with that. It's kind of a particular type of lesion, um, ladder medullary syndrome, they call it, that kind of thing. Um, and this is an interesting case because it's kind of functional lesion. So you're not necessarily, so you're inhibiting the FOR because of these connections. You talk about that with the Purkinje uh, fibers. So it's just like a, a good reminder that the, the brain <laughs> really interconnected, which is, you know, good because we have some redundancy and such, but also can be challenging because, you know, one area can affect another area. And I think that's a good lesson uh, for this part. Um, and pursuits can also be impaired in someone with lesions to the OMV, that uh, ocular motor vermis, and uh, we could see issues with horizontal pursuit. Um, and you talk about acceleration, kind of changing speed a little bit when we're testing is always good to see what happens there. And then contralateral acceleration for pursuit is decreased for those who have lesions in the vestigial uh, ocular motor region. And, you know, basically you're going to see impaired pursuits probably in this group is kind of the, 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 the take home of this section. And then uh, you even talk about bilateral lesions um, for that vestigial ocular motor region and um, how you can preserve horizontal smooth pursuit there um, because pursuit can be generated outside of the FOR. So this is a great way to say that sometimes a lesion is really specific, right? We're kind of, oh, we know if we see that, you know, periodic alternating nystagmus, we really kind of know where the lesion's at, but other cases, the you know, lesion gets hidden, right? Yeah. Um... You know, there's a, there's a diagram in the in the end of that article. Yes. I don't know this Venn it's diagram. Coming up. <laughs> so uh, you know, it, I I usually show that last diagram after I show a picture of someone pulling all their hair out. <laughs> uh, it, 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 it's just it makes life fun and difficult. But if you remember about examining saccades, and if you remember about gaze of oak nystagmus, and if you re remember about skews you are way ahead of the game with just mm -hmm. those three tests. That's a great take home for everybody. Uh, I don't want to leave this without talking about eye misalignment. We've kind of talked about it on and off here with the SKUs. You do cover how, you know, sometimes you don't know exactly where the lesions are when you see certain kinds of SKUs. And you did mention that hyperdeviation with the abducting eye when they're looking one way and the eye is higher on that abducting eye versus when they look the other way, it's the other eye that's higher. Um, so, you know, kind of checking for these signs. Again, these are just kind of 
like you say, red flags, kind of say, hey, <laughs> this is not what we're expecting to see, you know, in somebody uh, who is normal, who does not have a lesion of their cerebellum. Um, and then I had to touch on antisaccades. So antisaccades have come up a lot in relation to concussion lately. Um, and should we be treating them and how should we do that? And you do mention that the caudal dentate nucleus influences antisaccade generation, but it sounds like it's not the only area of the brain that handles this. Do you mind just touching on that briefly as we wrap up here? So antisaccades are another uh, laboratory curiosity, <clears throat> uh, although, you know, not, not totally, but um, uh, they're somewhat useful for certain conditions. Uh, quite frankly, the most useful bedside clinical abnormality of antipsychotics occurs in patients with Huntington's disease, Huntington's mm. chorea. They cannot inhibit a saccade to a target. So antipsychotic, when the target goes on here, you have to look the other way. That, that's what an antipsychotic right. is. And uh, in Huntington's disease, uh, you know, Huntington's disease, Arlo Guthrie's, Woody Guthrie's disease. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the patients cannot do this, probably because it's a mixed caudate, basal ganglia, frontal lobe problem, and that's how you would normally inhibit. Y you know, we would be looking at uh, every little movement that happened if we didn't have some way of uh, controlling where attention is important. And so an anti is is an extreme way of uh, getting rid of the reflex of brain, which is parietal saccade, and uh, encouraging the frontal eye fields, frontal saccades, to sort of take over and do things voluntarily. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's, it's uh, but at a bedside level, you know, it's not going to be useful. Uh, your best friend will probably make mistakes on the anti saccade test. Right, right. Now, I think that's a good point. Um, so, you know, some people hope this will eventually be diagnostic for concussion or something of that nature. I think to me, um, you know, if I have a patient who comes in and they're just having trouble with visual motion or kind of peripheral versus central type stuff, it is good to try to work, especially if they have visual motion sensitivity, this kind of visual vertigo type complaints, you know, we do want to kind of help hopefully train them up on what I call filtering, mm -hmm. just kind of trying to attend to different things in their environment and not kind of get visually overwhelmed. And we might cue them up or have them practice and hopefully habituate or desensitize them to, you know, visual motion, things like that. Um, but there's no magic in my head. It's really about just kind of meeting the patient where they are that day, trying to be you know, gradual about it, recognizing that, you know, in certain cases like vestibular migraine, you might actually trigger the migraine with too much input. So you got to kind of walk the line depending on how well managed it is, all these variables. Hopefully I didn't cover too much there, but I think you know where I'm getting at, Dr. Z. In terms of concussion, uh, you might not want to train patients uh, about not making or not making anti saccades, but you might want to use the ability to do anti saccades as a marker of how they're recovering from mm. their concussion. Mm -hmm. so, so, a lot of these saccade tests are just, they're wonderful markers for cognitive function. Uh, but training the saccade itself it may not help your thinking uh, or the diffuse, you know, cloudiness in your brain. Uh, so I, I don't want to say anti saccades are useless. I'm just saying I'm not sure training people to do anti saccades is going to have a lot of functional uh, consequences. Mm -hmm. Good. But I think reaction time and some of the other things that people maybe kind of don't maybe don't even realize are related to this, that can be very useful. I've definitely would say, you know, especially with the athlete, um, you know, but even the, the typical adult or that needs to be able to react for safety for driving. You know, I think there's something to be said for just kind of trying to train up balance and attention. And, you know, as physical therapists, we hopefully have a team, occupational therapy or speech therapy or whatever's appropriate. Uh, but sometimes you're a little bit on your own for various reasons. And so, you know, we do try to be a bit integrative, I think, which is okay. As far as training uh, a saccades, uh, I think one potentially fertile field is uh, training people to make covert instead of overt corrective saccades. So in other words, you want the, and visual acuity can get better 
when when you have more covert saccades. Uh, that brings up a, another point. I mean, uh, when you're measuring the VOR and measuring functional improvement, we only really care about if they can see better when they move their head. We, we don't care about how many covert saccades or <laughs> overt saccades or what the VOR gain is or how much is saccade. I mean, all these things are interesting, but the bottom line is, hey, is my patient functioning better? So uh, really these new tests of measuring eye movements and functional uh, uh, dynamic visual acuity at the same time are, uh, you know, potentially really much more important For in sure. my opinion. No, I think it's valid. And, and I think this is where people may get in the weeds, but I think having a big picture is always helpful, you know, when we're trying to think about how to help our patients functionally, for sure. So the, the nice conclusion of this paper that I saw was this kind of high frequency um, kind of focus, if you will, those high frequency responses for that flocculus paraflocculus, which we discussed. Um, and then the nodulus ventral uvula, important for low frequency sustained vestibular responses. And then, of course, the dorsal vermis and the vestigial nucleus, uh, posterior vestigial nucleus for the accuracy of saccades. And I do like to take a second towards the end of a talk to um, just mention uh, you and how great you are and how gracious you have been to give us your time. Um, you are a researcher. You are an author. If anyone has not read The Neurology of Eye Movements, go get one. It's great. Um, <laughs> you get a lot more information. You that <laughs> if you can't sleep, if you can't sleep <laughs> one night, just open up, open that book. Um, do you think you'll have another version? After? Oh, no, there, uh, we, we have three colleagues. Uh, John Lee and I said uh, we couldn't do it again. <laughs> but we have three of our younger colleagues who are working on the sixth edition. Awesome. Of Lee. It'll be Lee and Z's uh, Neurology of Eye Movements, which will be nice. Uh, I would say it's a good three years away. All right. Fair enough. It's a lot to cover. I don't envy them the, the workload there, but uh, it'll be great to see that. But in the meantime, uh, you can uh, crack open uh, the 2015 version, which still has tons of accurate information. And then, of course, you have hundreds of articles published. So if someone wants to just dig into the Dr. Z literature, there's plenty of options uh, uh, on that realm. And then you are lecturing. Uh, I wanted to mention uh, for this upcoming comprehensive vestibular course, which is being run by Johns Hopkins. Um, and so they're going to have a huge online component, which you can take by itself from May to September of this year. Uh, and the link I have listed there is a short link for folks to use if they want to go ahead and look into that and register. Um, if you want to do the in-person option for the competency testing, that's happening in September of this year. So, you know, check out that website and you'll get to hear more from Dr. Z um, if you take that course. So take advantage. And then a couple additional resources that are related to this topic. Uh, Vestibular First did just put out a short two-hour online course. So Dr. Z talked about, you know, kind of being able to identify what abnormal looks like. And for those who are newer, I would say, kind of your basic to intermediate clinician, I think this is a nice course. It really just kind of talks about this is what a right beat looks like. This is what a left beat looks like. We have our graphics, which you saw a couple of um, kind of during this talk. I put some in just to kind of get that clean example of a downbeat, for example. Um, and then we have lots of patient videos, uh, many of which were graciously shared uh, by the colleagues from Johns Hopkins, such as Dr. Gold. So um, feel free to check that out. And then Dr. Gold does have an eye movement collection, and there are other physicians that have added to that, as I understand. So you see the, the University of Utah has that um, kind of collection of eye movement videos. Any other resources that you recommend to folks? No, Dan Gold, my colleague, has wonderful videos. Um, of course, our book is fabulous, but that's another issue. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. You, you know, I, I think the ironically, the, the paper you picked really is, for me, the best, best sum. Um, my, my colleague, Paul Chang, uh, with Amir Karadman and myself, have a chapter. 
uh, on uh, sort of the examination of the dizzy patient, mm. which is kind of useful. Uh, you know, I, we can talk by email and I can send you that chapter. Sure, and I'll, I'll, um, I'll post up the uh, resource so people know where it's at on the comments of this uh, journal club right. after it's up. Perfect. Awesome. All right. All right, so we're ready to take questions. I'm sure folks have some. So let's go to that. Excuse me. There we go. All right, Jeff Walter, right out the gate. Uh, can you comment on the etiology and diagnostic testing considerations for subjects with chronic non vertiginous imbalance presenting with a downbeat nystagmus throughout the office exam? with no peripheral findings, and thanks for sharing your wisdom. So um, th these patients uh, often have uh, the, the beginning of a, what will become <clears throat> eventually a more diffuse cerebellar degeneration, uh, assuming there was no stroke to start this off or a structural lesion. Uh, and some of these patients can start out just with positional downbeat nystagmus. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, <laughs> you would have to look very carefully at the structures you told us today that are associated with downbeat nystagmus, the flocculus, the tonsil, the nodulus. Uh, there could be a residual from some other event like a uh, uh, acute thiamine deficiency, Wernicke's disease. And, and the other important thing, again, is if this were relatively recent, you would always be worried about some kind of uh, perineoplastic syndrome, you know, an immunological syndrome, where there are antibodies uh, related to a cancer somewhere in which there is a, a, an abnormal, abnormal function in the cerebellum. And in a woman in her 40s, you would be worried about ovarian cancer. You know, there, there are other kinds of things. So there's a long uh, sort of differential for that, but if it's been a very long standing thing and maybe just a little progressive, you know, two, three years or something like that, it may just be the harbinger, the beginning of a, of a degenerative process. But downbeat nystagmus must be evaluated mm -hmm. carefully. And if you don't find it the first time, you look again in six months, make sure there's no cancer creeping around there. Got it. Got it. So refer as a PT uh, to neurology um, and kind of I try when possible to to find out who they're going to see and and just let them know, um, you know, what I've seen. And, and, you know, hopefully they'll do their their due diligence, of course, to to kind of rule out and then monitor. Right. Exactly. Perfect. All right. Second question. I got this by email from Charlotte Hootakers, who is in the Netherlands. Um, in the Dix Hall Pike position with goggles, you sometimes see a left and right quick oscillating movement of the eyes with or without dizziness, but not spinning in younger people. How can you name this movement and what can be the cause? What part of the brain generates these movements? So to be honest, I'd have to see a video of what you're talking about. Um, if you simply mean the patient was looking left and right, left and right, uh, they might be nervous mm -hmm. or autonomic excitation from a little feeling of nausea or impending vertigo. Uh, if it was a nystagmus, that's another story. So to be honest, uh, get your iPhone out there and take <laughs> a video of this and send it up, send it, send it to us. Right, right. And if you have... Uh, you know, in, infrared video goggles. That's one argument because I've seen clinicians say, oh, I don't need them. Well, it's like, you know, it's so handy to me to have them on a patient. Even mm. there might be a nystagmus I could have seen in the light, but maybe I would only see it in the dark. But either way, now I've got two cameras right in front. <laughs> I can get a nice, good video um, and, and share that, you know, with, with the appropriateness of, of the So, so these video goggles are great. Uh, much better than trying to slap on friends with lenses and see. But you're also going to find that many normal subjects have teeny right. weeny bits of nystagmus. It can be vertical, it can be horizontal, and you don't have to call the fire department <laughs> with, with a little bit of uh, 
uh, two degrees per second of, of vertical nystagmus only with fixation removed mm -hmm. if they have nothing else. Yeah, and I think that's, that's a good take home. You know, don't panic at the first sign of something that looks like a slight anomaly, but, but looking for patterns. You know, are we seeing a big picture here? And we talked a little bit already about other neurologic signs or, you know, kind of anything else that would lead us down that path. And the nice thing about being a physical therapist is assuming this patient has imbalance, I should get to see them over a few weeks if they come back. <laughs> and so, you know, you can always check again or, you know, have them come back an X amount of time. And, and again, if you think you should refer, obviously refer. So medications too, any mm -hmm. sleeping pills, sedatives, anticonvulsants, tranquilizers, they, they all can give you teeny bits of nystagmus. Uh, it's central, <laughs> but it's caused by a medicine. Mm -hmm. Exactly. No, it's a good point. So, yes, do your best. Do your good exam. Don't panic and try to, you know, do the next right thing for our patients, right? Yeah. All right. Well, I think that is definitely time. So I don't want to stretch us too far over the hour here. But thank you, everyone, for tuning in, either live or if you're watching after. We appreciate it. And uh, a special thank you to Dr. Z for his time. Again, really, really valuable insights. We really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Just remember my initials, DZ. You Dizzy. got it. Dizzy. Oh, gosh, I love it. <laughs> You're almost as good as... No, that's better than mine. Mine is Helena to my patients because they can lean on me when they have imbalance. So there you go. <laughs> all right. Well, we really appreciate all right, it. Good luck with all this. Thank you very much. You did a great job, by the way. You really knew that stuff. Congratulations. Thank you. And, and thank you for all your work. And we'll see you guys next month with another great journal club. So have a great evening. Bye-bye.